welcome to the Groundwater Division's webinar and in collaboration with the Groundwater Division Gauteng branch. Please fill in the attendance register, which will pop up in a form of a poll on your screen. This is for the CPD certificates and attendance. If you do not manage to fill in the attendance register, please do type in your name and organization in the chat box. Our agenda for this afternoon's webinar, which will run between now and three o'clock, is that it's a 0.2 CPD accredited uh, webinar. We have an, we're excited to have our invited speaker, Nico Fansail, and he will be presenting to us. And after the speaker's presentation, we'll then have a short question and answer session. We, are, we welcome your questions and please do note them down during his presentation. And then at the end, we will request your feedback, evaluating our webinar in accordance with a CBT, CB, CPD accredited webinar. Please do stay on to evaluate the webinar at the end of our question and answer sessions and at the end of the webinar. We really hope you will enjoy our webinar and our invited speaker, Nico Fansel, a bit of background on Nico. Nico is the director and groundwater modeler at HydroGreek Consulting. He has worked with several consulting companies, including Aegis and Golda, and he has over 10 years experience in the hydrogeological and groundwater modeling fields. And he's a professionally registered earth scientist he has completed his MSc degree in hydrogeology with the University of the Free State. And over the past few years, Nico has honed his skills in groundwater modeling, uh, primarily to aid groundwater investigations in the mining industry. He has been involved in a range of mining projects, including groundwater dewatering modeling for open pit and underground mines, contaminant transport models of mine waste residue facilities, as well as water supply modeling to aid in sustainable development of aquifers for water supply augmentation. He has experience that spans government, the private sector, as well as tertiary sectors. And he has worked, I would say, from all over the world. And his projects span South Africa, the DRC, Zambia, Mozambique, Ghana, Botswana, Argentina, United Arab Emirates, Peru, Australia, the United States, Germany, and the list is continuing. So he has various experience from geology and groundwater modeling from across the world. And I've also had the pleasure of learning from Nika during our time at Golda and with regards to numerical groundwater modeling. Ladies and gentlemen, please use your reaction buttons on the screens and use the clapping icons. Help me welcome our speaker this afternoon, uh, Mr. Nika Fansail. Nika, over to you. Thanks, Odai. Um, at this point, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Perfect, so you can see it. So thanks Odai for that introduction. Um, I'm very excited to share with you guys what I feel has been coming for a while in our in the groundwater modeling space, but it's sort of caught flame the last um, while. Um, and I'm very excited to share. Um, I think we also got, um, just in terms of, we also got Rui Hagman joining. Which I, so from the GMBSI um, initiative, which is also got a lot of experience and they sort of driving this whole decision support groundwater modeling. So in terms of decision support groundwater modeling, um, I think groundwater modeling has got extreme potential um, to manage environmental systems, but it's currently not quite uh, living up to that uh, potential. And most people that receive groundwater models are disappointed in their results, um, often to, oftentimes complex, numerically unstable, and yeah, so I'll get into that. So I've drawn a lot of inspiration lately from the GMDSI um, website, 
and everything that's um, sort of they're driving there. So a lot of what I've shared with, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, the stuff John Doherty and Catherine Moore and the, the React and them and the JBSI has been sharing, um, we'll probably see a lot of repeat on that. So in terms of table of contents, I'll go through to what is decision support modeling? Why do we model? What are we up against in ground to modeling? Uncertainty, uh, base equation, uh, final thoughts. And as I said, sources, um, PEST, which is a big driver um, from John Doherty, the author of PEST and the GMDSI, which later on I'll share a bit more about. So when we start thinking about decision support modeling, we have to ask ourselves, um, why are we modeling? Um, we have to start, we need to answer questions related to ground to models, uh, to ground to problems. So just to give us an example of a few um, questions we get asked, we get asked to um, examples in groundwater. So we get asked, um, what, are, what are the repercussions of lamp subsidence? Does design a dewatering system that keeps a pit dry? Will the dewatering affect the wetlands, springs, and the community wells? Um, will the dewatering, um, what's the volume we need for pipes? Um, how, what contaminants are in the ground? Um, what are loads to rivers and streams? How long will the system take to recover? In terms of post closure, is there enough water to sustain irrigation at present rates? So we as groundwater models need to come up with ways to answer these questions. And um, you know, perhaps we need more than one model to predict each of these questions. Just in terms of an example that's been lately been, been using is to do I a dewatering system that keeps a pit dry? So we get asked to dewater, dewater a pit tell us the inflows, please, and how we can design a dewatering system for this with boreholes, with horizontal drain wells, possibly inflows into the future. And we also get asked to decontamination from sources, uh, go back into history, see what the load's contribution is, how can we um, manage the system, how can we do any scavenger wells, uh, in terms of we get questions from liners, um, so this is the type of questions we need to answer um, as groundwater modelers. But we're dealing with um, the subsurface and the nature of the medium we're dealing with is very heterogeneous. Um, that's just the nature of what we're dealing with, dealing with subsurface um, flows that we've got no idea what's happening underground. We've got features, we've got connected, disconnected features, we've got faults, we've got weathering. And in reality, this is what we know. So we've got such a scarce data in subsurface modeling, and we have to interpolate between boreholes. So um, estimation of pressure system states, fluxes, concentrations, measurement points are uncertain. Um, but we've got, we, Although we know very little about the system, we've got, we know a little bit of it, which we can use. We've got data measurements in terms of flows, heads, um, rainfall, and we've got uh, rules of conservation. So another example of just that sort of the reality we're dealing with, and that's what we know. Um, so there's a lot of assumptions we make, and in any, in any model, which we create, which we have to parameterize, is there's a range, there's a huge range of possible parameters that can fit any given data set. So model outputs, um, so our task is to support decisions. So if we look at the traditional conceptual model workflow, is we usually need to ask, we, we usually, we look at the data, we, we they need to, you need to say, Where's the water coming from? Where is water going to? What type of rocks does it flow through? Um, what are the sources of contamination? Then as, um, as groundwater modelers, we'd get asked, take this, which is a, sort of a, a hydrogeologist, John calls it a hydrogeologist playground, where he puts in everything he th thinks he knows about the system and which the data tells him, and he asked the model to replicate this complexity into a groundwater model that looks like 
the real thing. And oftentimes our models get given a complex structure um, because it looks realistic and it's, it's numerically unstable, it's super complex. And if you've built some of these models, you start to panic because um, this is one sort of one realization of reality and we built a complex model and we give it a simple parameterization um, in terms of to calibrate it. And a lot of times we calibrate it in steady state as we were taught and in transient state, it doesn't work. We're seeing our inflows are too high and we start to panic, we go back to steady state calibrate it again but in, in actual fact there are many parameter sets that calibrate the model and in, in for us to cover the uncertainty of it we actually need to give a prediction for each of those sets that calibrates the model and we often we often get told just get it below a normalized routine square of five percent and oftentimes we can't fit the data and um, we just say that it's overfitting. So I su we suggest um, so that what the one way of changing our thought process about the flow of information to support this decision is um, to argue that the flow of information is just as important as the flow of water. If we can start with looking at the prediction and work backwards, we can ask questions like, what prediction does the model have to make? Um, a lot of times I get asked by clients um, in South Africa to just build a model. And, and that's definitely not that sort of a recipe for disaster because you don't end up setting up the model to answer a specific question. So another question is, what affects its uncertainty? What data do we have that informs this prediction? How can we use the data to reduce its uncertainty? So information reduces uncertainty. And the flow of information is just as important as the flow of water. That's pro this is probably the first step, I think, where we go wrong if you want to do decision support modeling. So in terms of sources of information in groundwater modeling that we have is We've got direct information about the system. We've got site assessments, geological mapping, direct measurements, water levels, pump test, which we usually do in a site characterization study. We draw borals, we do aquifer test on them, but we also have the behavior system. So it's a different scale, but still it gives us parameters we can use in our models in terms of storage or porosity, um, in terms of the I mean, base flow recharge, so we've got the behavior system, the direct measurement, and in groundwater modeling, which is very, it's actually very unique, is that we need to blend these two sources of information and predict and make a prediction for management decisions. So they both give us parameters, um, but we as modelers need to enable the flow of information between these two sources. So, I'll share with you guys one question because a lot of the stuff I think I'm sharing is a lot of concepts and but I want to keep it as as such but base equation is sort of our guiding light and mission um, which is actually not difficult to understand but you start off so so we start off with a prior probability distribution so we start off with a prior probability distribution in base equation and our certainty, so we use our site knowledge um, to come up with a prior probability distribution. Then through history matching, we reduce the uncertainty of our predictions. And then we come up with a posterior yeah. probability distribution. So the, the, the big thing to understand here is we start with uncertainty and we end with uncertainty. So our knowledge, because our groundwater flows through heterogeneous you know, nature of our, our units is very heterogeneous, our knowledge needs to be expressed stochastically, which it's not. So we need to be, get to a stage where we express it stochastically. And this is why we should model, is we need to let the information flow to a place where we can reduce our uncertainty. 
to prevent the bad thing from happening. Um, because I think currently we, we were tr we're in, in South Africa, we try to um, get sort of into the center of this in terms of our calibration. But this doesn't, for me, this doesn't aid decision support because what if this thing happens here? It's still, it's still, the model's still calibrated, uh, but so that also needs a prediction and we need to, um, you know, we need to be able to communicate that. So modeling serves base equation, not the other way around. And a making, making a decision is all about quantifying and reducing the uncertainty. So, and we must embrace it. That's just, that's just groundwater. We need to embrace uncertainty and especially parameter non-uniqueness. So if we seeking to calibrate the model, we're seeking uniqueness, which we would never, um, never have. And one thing that um, was also shared by John Doherty is that sort of the new way of thinking about modeling, the old way was to, but if you don't know it, just keep it constant. Just, if you don't know it, just keep it constant where he argues that if you don't know it, let it wiggle. So within the respected boundaries and range, but let it wiggle. So don't, don't, um, I don't make it fixed. In terms of parameters, I'll share something that was shared by Francesco Lotti at the um, IO Congress in Brazil. So we currently, um, we, we were building complex crystallized models with a fixed model structure with long run times, um, headaches, possible instabilities, late nights, trying to fix this model and to, just to invoice the client and hope he doesn't see what we did because it can't really run forever. It's just not effective at all. Often a poor fit as well with our um, parameters, but at least it looks like we know what we're doing. We're arguing that we need to go for a structurally less complex model, but parameterize it um, with parameters. Just give it, make it, make the parameterization complex. So in terms of uh, meaningful details are expressed in an abstract manner, faster run times, better stability, and generally a good fit if your parameters um, are not credible. There's sometimes a conceptual problem. Um, so we need to move to a more parameter complex system uh, where we have a simple structure that is fast running. Um, yeah, I mean, complex, we're all familiar with complex models are painful. And they oftentimes, they can't quantify uncertainty because it's just one realization that's so rigid in what we did. Um, so we're starting with a prediction, working backwards, and then figuring out what structure or process matters and then how to best account for them in our models is the way forward. So what are we up against in groundwater model? Um, so I'll show you an example from a PhD student from, from uh, one of the, um, John, from, from the John Doherty um, slides. I actually asked his permission to use this, so everything is good. Um, so let's say we've got a model grid and let's say we give it a flow of 50 cubes a day at the northern boundary and it exits it exits here at the head boundary at zero so we release a particle and it flows all the way down into our system and it exits of the three two five six days this is the reality then we calibrate the model perfectly with 12 head measurements and we calibrate the model perfectly then we do exactly the same so we've got a perfectly calibrated model and we get an exit time of 7122 days, which is 100% incorrect. So what, what can we conclude from this is that history matching is non-unique and there are, very, there are different ways to fit the 12 head measurements. So certainty when it comes to groundwater modeling, I will never have. I will never be certain. Um, so a calibrated model it doesn't give us the power to give the right answer. So, and this is another thing, we should never expect the right answer from a groundwater model. So a good model is a model that supports specific 
uh, management decision of interest. It quantifies the uncertainty of that prediction and it assimilates data to reduce that range of uncertainty. Um, I mean, there are possibly 20, 50, 100, 100 combinations of parameters that satisfies any um, set, of set of calibration. Um, and this is, our, this is our uncertainty and we need to communicate that. That modeling is not um, a crystal ball. Once you have a groundwater model, everything is sorted. So um, there's uncertainty in what we do, and we need, but we are not very good at simulating what's happening. But we are we can we are very good at assimilating the data with programs like PEST or PEST plus plus. So this is what we should use. So why do we model? Um, Albert Einstein said, smart people simplify things. So why do we model? We should model to inform a decision of what could go wrong, to manage a system, to quantify the uncertainty, to critical model predictions, to manage means to avoid something going wrong. And in terms of managing risk, um, I would be much happier as a decision maker to have a histogram answer then a single answer and something goes wrong and I didn't know about it. So in terms of modeling, there's uncertainty to our predictions. Um, so we need to make, um, make a prediction and not just simulate a system. Um, we have, so the correct prediction is, ne is not ours to have, um, but we can quantify the uncertainty of it. So management of a system, um, scientific um, instruments. So let's say we've got a resource here and we need to say, we need to predict what's the impact gonna be here in terms of borals or wetland or what's the impact at community wells. Um, so what if we could build models um, to predict what's the bad thing that's gonna happen? So we say the water levels can't drop maybe by five meters or the concentration shouldn't reach this level in a river or borer. Um, so then we obviously, perhaps in this case, we don't even know what's happening there. We just, we just make a prediction of the bad thing happening. So what if we only had one hypothesis to be tested in a groundwater model? And perhaps we need a few um, models to make predictions. We can't just build a model and answer everything with it. So examples, um, a few examples as a, as a manager stakeholder. I think to just request a model is um, not wise. I think to better to say, um, what is the bad thing I need to manage? What is my pump capacity perhaps? Um, yeah, well, how much dams do I have to take volumes of water. Um, so in term, define the bad things whose avoidance constitutes good management. Then inquire whether model-based processing and pertinent data can be used to assess the likelihood of this occurrence. And this is exactly what we can do with the programs we have. So model-based support may therefore require construction, history matching, deployment of a number of models, each addressing different aspects. Modeling is always a means, it's never an end. Simulating system is not a valid end. So, yeah, so to use the model to simulate and not look blindly at the results it's giving, but rather let's quantify that uncertainty and let's reduce it with data. So in terms of um, summary, groundwater modeling, um, I think it needs to be more scientific method as, at, than present. Because it always bothered me um, that you you do a, you do a groundwater model for an area, and then it gets reviewed, obviously gets reviewed, and then twenty guys would do the same model and get twenty answers, and for me that's not science because you, you can't rip. It's obviously they're probably all within the probability distribution, but sort of if we quantify that uncertainty, then for me that's a much more better way. To approach, um, to approach it then asking 20 modelers, getting 20 different answers, but each guy calibrated the model. Um, so I think there's this, this way of doing it is just a lot better. 
Model outputs are uncertain. We know that because we're dealing with heterogeneous system. Um, we cannot simulate on the ground very well, and we need to accept that. Um, we need, but we can assimilate data well. With programs like PEST, PEST++, we can, um, yeah, you know, we can actually use our programs to do a lot better job. So we need less structurally, less complex models. This is one realization of reality. We need to make the models complex as parameters. And this is a trap we all fall into, is we try and make it complex because then it looks like we know what we're doing and it looks like the real thing because we can present the geology. But oftentimes um, they are slow models. They, they just give us headaches, they make us panic. So um, this is just such a refreshing way of doing it. And um, we need to do it. So modeling is about informing a decision and not about simulating the system. So what is the decision you need to support? That's very important. That's the first thing you need to ask yourself. What is the decision that needs to be supported by this model? And then we cannot see into the future, but we can assimilate data to people that make decisions in a way that quantifies the uncertainty of our predictions. And the tools and the methods and the advancement that um, the guys from GMDSI and John Doherty has been doing and Jeremy White from PEST++ has been, um, yeah, you know, it's been very cool. So we need fast and simple models um, and not slow, complicated models because we need to be able to link this up with the PEST and run um, the uncertainty analysis with it. So I think it's a far more honest way to reproduce our results. Um, I just thought I'll give you a few snapshots of um, some of the uncertainty analysis that can be done. This is in fee based so you can actually do uncertainty analysis in terms of pit inflows over time, over a 20 year pit plan. You can give it as histograms, what are the, and depending on, I got a question the other day that asked, but what if, um, what, if, what if I want my one answer, then you can still get your one answer from this, depending on your appetite for, for risk. So you can choose your, one answer in that histogram. But the correct prediction is not ours to have. In terms of we, this is the, the base where I said you get your prior and you do a posterior through history matching and you can see perhaps a bad thing would happen there. And this is sort of the, the new way of calibrating is um, pilot points. Um, so you give your model pilot points, which is as a parameter and within the prior knowledge you have of the system, it calibrates, it can calibrate models and, and give uncertainty ranges to observations, to our K values, recharge. So um, this is also another example. This is the same sort of thing. And there's a sort of probability, the fifth and 95th percentile uh, probability ranges. This is just to show pilot points, calibrating K, K values in terms of if you, if, if you give it heads, this is sort of in, in paste. And this is the example I showed with the realizations of the exit point of a point where we have maybe a thousand realizations um, that calibrates our data set. And for each of them, do a prediction and you come up with the exit time of the particle with a frequency uh, percentage. That's, for me, that's a better answer than just one bar. Um, this, um, so this is just sort of an example of the new um, that's going on with the, this is the latest in PEST++ with the, just an example smoother. So what it basically does is it um, gets, gets parameter fields, it runs the model, it sort of fits it, it compares it with data, and it's and it's make a selection and it, it just gets a, a selection of the calibrated parameter fields and that's us i can use it to quantify that uncertainty so in terms of um when i refer to the gmdsi i'd like to refer you guys to um, the exciting things they're busy with um on their website they these worked examples i think there's about six already or seven Maybe we can um, also give some feedback on if you have any questions on it. These educational videos, um, it's really the last few months has been great to look at all of this stuff and just to, um, to realize that 
that is uh, the advances in in our field is definitely a step in the right direction and i think globally the global community is what i've seen is sort of um catching up to it and i think it's just a better way of of, of communicating groundwater and um so I'll, I'll refer you to guys to the gmdsi website and that's it from my side um uh, back to you Dai. Thank you so much, Nico, for that insightful presentation. I think you have certainly shifted my way of thinking. Uh, I used to model and I used to think posterior probability was the way to go, but now I realize that a prior probability is definitely the way to go. So you have really shifted the way I'm looking at modeling and as a decision support tool. We are now going to take this moment to engage uh, in your questions to Nico. If you could kindly type in your questions in the chat box, or if you have perhaps a longer question, you could indicate by way of showing your hand up, and then I can then select your question from there. Uh, the chat box is now open for your question sessions. Anything about groundwater modeling, Nico is the person you should be asking these questions to. He is the right person to be asking these questions to. As we wait for those questions to come in, Nico, I have a question to you. As somebody who used to model, I think I, I stopped modeling two years ago and it seemed like a whole new world has come about. How should modelers look at data i know you've hinted at we need to express information more stochastically and how we need to also simplify move to more simple parametrization i know it's easier said than done but as a groundwater modeler watching this webinar how, what would you be your basic 101 instruction on how they can possibly be able to replicate that in their work environment, uh, take that into a practical format. What steps would you uh, guide in with that regard? How should they look at their data when they begin their model? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, um, um, I think a, a good way of looking at it is in terms of, um, we need to look at all the data we have. So we need to plot that um, out in histograms and see, we need to look at the system behavior. Um, but in terms of our expert knowledge is still important, but we should still give room for um, the calibration in our models to surprise us. We still, we need to give, we, we should give room for, to be surprised by what calibrates the set. But in terms of, for me, I think lately I've been, I think to, to know PEST is a good starting point to learn PEST. Uh, geostatistics is very important and, the, the, and still to understand your system. I think a lot of modelers um, they just want a model. Um, like let's just, let's just build a model where I think a lot of work needs to be done before we model. And I think a lot of guys rush into um, building a model and then having such a rigid structure that it can't really simulate the data. So the data can't really flow through our models because it's the concept, then we stop, then please do a model. And I think that that needs to be in parallel. The, the conceptual and the ground to modeling um, can be more in, in parallel. I don't know if, if, if Rui has got a better way of thinking about it. Uh, thanks, Nico. We have somebody on the chat box who would like to know, how do you know if you are oversimplifying the model? As you've shown, a calibration model isn't necessarily correct. How do you know if you, are if you have oversimplified the model? Because you, you spoke of how you've shown that a calibrated model isn't necessarily correct. That, that's a question from uh, one of our, our viewer webinar attendees. Perhaps, um, Rui, do you 
got some ideas, but do you, I think that's sort of what you guys are busy with. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. You're just throwing me the, the difficult questions, eh, Nico? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you know if you are uh, oversimplifying the model? Well, it, it, it's inherent in the idea of if you are simplifying your model is that you have some expert knowledge that helps that um, on which you are basing your simplification. So you you inherently will not apply a simplification which is going to affect either your ability to assimilate data, so to, to get information from, from um, site data, or if that simplification is going to adversely affect your prediction of interest, so your, your management uh, forecast that, you, that you're interested in, in modeling. Now, adopting this approach to a uh, much more stochastic approach to, to modeling does make things a lot more uh, forgiving. So because you're not coming up with a single answer, you're, you're not, you don't have to come up with the correct answer. You just have to be sure that your, your posterior probability, so that, that range of possible answers which you come up with at the end, include the true, the true answer. Uh, if you simplify your model, you can design it in a way, or you can design that simplification in a way that it will only amplify uncertainty. So the, the cost of simplifying a model is that you will have more uncertainty, but the benefit is that you can actually quantify that, that uncertainty because your model is simple and you can include lots of parameters and you can test all of those parameters and you can make them wiggle. Uh, whilst if you had a very complicated model that takes hours to run and you can't test all of those possible variations, then you're simply not able to do that. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, and a dime. Maybe I can also add, I think that's a very good read. And I think also it's better to start with a simple model. You can rather add complexity than building a monster and with so much complexity that you, you don't even know where to start. So let's say you build a simple model and you see it doesn't satisfy perhaps boundary conditions or perhaps structurally, perhaps we need a fault or perhaps we know about aquatot, then we can add that into our model, but we need to start simple um, and then see, like we said, how it affects our predictions and our calibration. Then we can sort of go on about making it more complex. But I think the starting point should be rather structurally um, simple, but oh, let's give it a lot of parameters. And I'll just add one last thing to that. There's, there are also methods to test the sensitivity, essentially the sensitivity of um, either a model prediction or um, observations for which you have field data to the simplification that you've introduced. So you can, you can um, mathematically quantify whether that simplification is actually going to affect your calibration or, and or your prediction. So it, it, it's quite a forgiving way of going about stuff. Thank you for so much for that. Now the chat box is still open for further questions or should you want to raise your question via audio, just indicate by way of uh, raising your hand using the reaction button and we will get to you. Nico, what are some of the ways we can shift perceptions. I know there's people from uh, government who are looking at groundwater models for regulation or uh, applying for water use licenses. I know there's people, people in industry that want a groundwater model for the sake of complying. How can we shift, shift perceptions uh, of what the value of a groundwater model in, in informing decision and the value of uh, of the decision in an impact either to a mining environment, either to our well fields or our environment at large. What are the key, I would say, takeaways that we need to take home to shift our perceptions on how we currently are looking at models in a singular way to provide a single answer instead of uh, what you've just highlighted, the, the range of answers that have that uh, correct answer, if I can put it in the inverted commas, falling within that range, what, what should we walk away with uh, that would have changed our way of thinking of modeling? 
Yeah, oh, that's a good question. I think because a lot of our modeling gets driven by the regulators, so they need it for uh, uh, we'll choose license or, um, but I think sort of um, what I feel like, I think we've failed each other both ways. Realty Modelers has failed to give, uh, to, to communicate our answers correctly or in a way just not a single answer, but also I think what is expected from a groundwater model to be this crystal ball that just gives all the answers you need is, is needs to change. And I think in this way, I think it's stochastically in terms of, it's just a better way of going about it. But I think, uh, and I think uh, as it goes on, I think people will um, gain more trust in this way of thinking. I mean, like the, the, if I think about the, the petroleum industry or even gold sim modeling in terms of surface water, it's all stochastically based and they run Monte Carlo and um, so why can't we do that in groundwater? It's a lot easier in surface water. Eh? Groundwater has a lot more or hydrogeology or uh, the geology in particular introduces a lot more complication when you want to do things stochastically. It's, it's, it's relatively easy in hydrology. But yeah, everything you said was spot on. Uh, thank you. We have a, a question in the chat box from Annalisa. She says, hi, Nico, nice presentation. You briefly touched on the capabilities of PEST. Please, would you kindly further explain some of its functionalities? Um, let me just see the question. Is she referring to PEST or PEST++? Uh, yes, PEST++, plus plus plus. Plus. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps that's one for Risa. I've started looking at um, PEST++ plus plus, um, in terms of like the Tetraf Ensemble Smoother. I know that it's it's sort of the new big talking thing in, in groundwater modeling that I, from the USGS. Perhaps Rick can, I, I know what it can do, but perhaps Rick can explain it a bit better than me. Uh, so PEST++ plus plus is, is actually lots of different versions of software. Um, I'm just going to run through quickly through a few of them, and I'll talk specifically about IES, which is, I think, what most people associate to PES++. So there's PES++ GLM, which stands for Gauss, Liebenberg, Marquardt. And you can think of it essentially as um, vanilla PEST, um, but upgraded. It does, it does everything that the original PEST does, um, but it also undertakes uh, linear uncertainty analysis and uh, null space Monte Carlo and um, a bunch of other things um, at the same time. So it essentially makes all of the PEST workflows a lot more uh, seamless and with a lot less user intervention, just makes things easier to do. Um, PEST++ plus plus IES, the iterative, iterative ensemble smoother, is a completely different way about, of thinking about um, model calibration, or I should say history match, matching rather than calibration. So rather than attempt to find um, a single parameter set which best fits your, your measured data, what IES does is it tries to, it tries to, it starts from a, a, a random selection of um, parameter fields, so it's no longer one single model, it's many models, usually a couple of hundred. And those models will have a different set of parameters which are randomly sampled from a prior probability distribution which the user must create uh, or must, must specify. And that, that prior will reflect your um, expert knowledge and the, the site characterization data that you have so to describe the probability distribution of parameters. IES will then take all of those, those uh, realizations, all of those models, and it will try to fit all of them to your, your um, site data, to your observations. So it's no longer one single parameter set, it's an ensemble of parameter sets, all of which must, uh, your goal is to have all of those uh, being able to adequately uh, replicate uh, measured data the outcome is then for, by simulating that entire ensemble of history matched models, you get a, a nice um, 
posterior probability distribution of your forecast of interest. So it essentially encapsulates the idea of, of base equation into um, a groundwater modeling workflow. And the, the big change that IES introduced is that it, it's no longer limited by the, or the number of model runs that it requires to, to do all that history matching is not um, linked to the number of parameters you have, as in at the Gauss uh, Liebenberg Marquardt uh, method, which PEST and PEST TLM implement. So this means you can have every single model cell can be a parameter. You can have Ks for every single model cell, uh, uh, storage parameters, etc. There's no limit in terms, or there's very lim little limit in terms of the maximum number of parameters you can use. And the more parameters that you have, the better you, you are able to represent uncertainty in your model. And that's the big advantage of, of IES. There are also a bunch of other new things coming out. There's PES++ DA, which is a sequential data simulation. That's so far ahead that even uh, most of us aren't quite familiar with it yet. I think it just came out in the latest release. It's a completely different way of making models. I'm not going to talk about it. I think it's a bit too much. Um, there's, oh, it's a bit too much for the time being. It's worth a, a single presentation just for that. And there's two, also two um, optimizations. So there's PES++ OPT, which is a linear optimization uh, algorithm, and PES++ MOU, which is, which is a multi-objective optimization under uncertainty, which is pretty powerful and, again, worth its own presentation on. I think that pretty much covers it. Hope that answered your question, Annalisa. Thank you, that was very interesting. It seems like PIS++ has a lot more functionality and capability than the traditional PIST, even though it is a subdivision, but it's very cool. Thanks. Thanks, and we'll take one last question from the chat box from Daste which is when dealing with a large site that has lots of complexity, is it advisable to chop the area into more than one model for the sake of simplification? Example, large mining site undergoing strip mining. Nico, your take on that? Yeah, so my take on that is, I think it, it all depends on what decision you need to support. Um, yeah, for me, that's if 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 you can if you know what decision you need to, you need to support, then um, that obviously affects how we, how simple or how complex we need to build the model, and also what the other geology is like. But in my experience, that if you have one layer models um, with with pilot points, um, you can get a lot of complexity into in terms of parameters into that type of models. Um, but I think it all depends on this decision you need to support. All right, thank you. We are almost at the end of our webinar session. I think this was a very short webinar and we, we should really arrange for a, a more in-depth training of sorts or workshop and uh, get those uh, standardization of how we as industry, as hydrogeologists, groundwater modelers, or related fields should be looking at modeling in a, in a, in a more different light. Could you kindly uh, fill out the evaluation form, which will evaluate our webinar in a form of a poll that will pop up on your screen. This will take 10 seconds to fill out. And should there be a section where you need to type out, tell us what more you would like to uh, find out or even in the chat box about groundwater modeling what 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 about groundwater modeling would you like uh, us to arrange either workshop uh, to get better understanding to get a, a better industry understanding or get us all on board and looking at groundwater modeling in more or less the same light so we can advance together as a hydrogeologist and in, in our industry as a whole and I'd also like to take this opportunity to
thank our presenter, Nika Panseo, for taking his time out to put in together such an insightful presentation. I know I have uh, shifted the way I see groundwater modeling altogether. And by the time I, I get behind my screen and start modeling again, I will model with fresh eyes and new insights. Nika, thank you so much for your time. And this webinar will be shared on the Groundwater Division's uh, YouTube channel within a week's time. So if you know a friend that has missed the webinar and would like to catch up on what has gone down in today's webinar, they are, will be, that webinar will be available on our YouTube channel and they will be able to go through what we uh, have gone through in today's webinar. And thank you to our contributors, to you for attending online. Don't forget, if you haven't uh, put your name down to uh, for the CPD certificate, please leave your name in the chat box. We'd like to hear your comments and uh, how we can improve and, and build on what we've already started. Uh, and yes, thank you for, I think it's Rui, Rui for his contribution as well to, to this webinar. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, once you have uh, finished that evaluation form, uh, I see we still have several people who are still filling it in. Uh, please do stay on the line while filling it in. And uh, this now brings us to the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day further.